Hey everyone, welcome. Welcome to the Customer Success Webinar Series. This is our second session. We're gonna talk about deep analytics use cases. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on this webinar series. Uh, refresher for some of you, but for the new folks. Um, what's been going on is at Comprise, we've been doing a monthly release cadence. We've been doing that for about a year now. And it's worked out great because now we have a vehicle every month to, to carry to you new features, capabilities, enhancements, and all that stuff. Um, one of the challenges though, is that uh, because they're rolling out on a regular basis, a lot of new features, unless they're critical or someone's waiting for them, a lot of times they, they fall under the radar screen. So we're finding that with our existing customer base, there's a lot of new features and capabilities out there that they're, they're just not aware of. So the whole intent behind this webinar series is to take a step back, walk through uh, the main features and capabilities that came out of the last few quarters, walk you through some examples and demos and all that good stuff. Um, this is not a sales pitch. It's not a marketing pitch. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a nuts and bolts presentation of the new capabilities uh, purely for you to make better use of your subscription with Comprise. Um, actually, uh, I forgot. My, my name is Scott Slamba. I'm the head of customer success. And with me is Paul Chen, who's the uh, head of product uh, management. And uh, I forgot to say that because we actually there's an intro slide. We probably want to bring up Paul. Sure thing. Um, wait, wait for this to come up. Okay, and before we get, to, yeah, here we are. Uh, you can see us on video, you get pictures of us now. And then, um, Paul, if you go forward, there's a few logistics I wanna talk about. Yeah, if you guys haven't figured out yet, uh, if you need to enlarge your screen, there is a icon in the upper right-hand corner. Looks like a square bracket that'll enlarge your screen. Uh, secondly, uh, we want to keep this uh, informal and interactive, so please ask questions. Uh, as an audience, uh, you're not going to be able to ask questions audibly, but there's a question mark button on the right-hand side of your screen, and you can ask questions there. Uh, we'll try and address them as we go along. Um, if, if sometimes we might have later uh, questions or, or off-topic questions, we'll save those for the end. Uh, and then finally, this is a 30-minute session. Uh, but depending on the dialogue and questions that come in, we might run over. Uh, last session, we had a lot of great questions, a lot of good dialogue, and I think we ran about five minutes over. So just be prepared for that. Um, thank you, Paul. Uh, so today, uh, we're going to do a quick recap of what we talked about last time. Uh, and then uh, Paul's going to review some of the common deep anal analytics use cases. Uh, he's got some demonstrations he's going to walk through. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, we'll, there's a catch-all for any questions we don't catch during the uh, during the presentation. Okay, so what did we talk about last time? Uh, so Paul walked through the major features of the 4.x product that came out about a year ago. So, so uh, there's a summary slide here that you're looking at. Um, also, we did talk about the end of life policy. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're on this monthly release cadence now. So um, to, to support every release indefinitely is just not practical. So we do have to retire releases on a regular basis. <clears throat> uh, also, we want you to be on the latest and greatest releases. It, it just provides you with a better experience with Comprise. So um, it's a month later. So if you see on the slide, the, the, the most current release was 461 the last time we spoke. We're now in October. We came up with a new release, monthly release. We're now currently on 462. Uh, is, as far as the long-term supported preferred release, that is 451. So if you're on uh, releases much earlier than that, recommendation is to upgrade. Uh, please reach out to your um, uh, CSM to talk about that or file a support ticket and we can get you upgraded to the latest and greatest releases. Oh, also what I forgot to mention is um, from the last session, uh, that's been recorded. So if you missed the last session or if you wanted to revisit it, uh, if you go back to the registration site, you should have an email with the registration site, uh, the recording sitting there. If you no longer have that email, uh, the easiest way to get the recording is to go to your Fresh Desk support portal and on the home page under announcements will be a, a listing of the of the events and, and pointers to that. So you can always watch the previous recordings as well as this one being recorded in future ones. That's where you can go. Sorry about it. Yeah, next, yeah. Okay, and then last, last session, uh, what, what Paul did was he, Provided a deep analytics overview, um, walked you through how you go about tagging, and then how you can take action upon deep analytics queries. And then on this week's call, uh, what we'll give you <coughs> more deep analytics use cases. So 
Showback is a buddy goody. He's been doing that one forever. Very popular. Uh, with the uh, release of, of SBAC a few months back, a few months ago, share based access control. We've got more uh, user level uh, activity and use cases happening. So he's going to walk you through user driven tagging. Uh, we've also got to talk about the copy and confined use cases, and finally, uh, smart data workflows. And I'll let Paul explain what that is because he does it a thousand times better than I do. And with that, I think I will turn it over to Paul. Thanks, Scott. I'll share my screen now. Very good. So the first use case that we'll talk about is the showback use case. And of course, showback is something that uh, IT teams have been doing ever since storage was invented. You need to show your end users and your quote unquote end customers how much storage they're using and kind of generally how much they're costing the organization. Of course, you want them to use their data, generate their data, keep their data. So once data is uh, no longer useful, has outlived its utility, it's best if you can be archived to something, someplace cheaper, some cheaper storage. Usually what happens is the IT admin will go in, look at how much storage is being used, try to figure out who's using it, and then generate a report and then send that report out to the division, uh, different division heads, department heads, and let them know you're using X amount of storage. With Comprise, of course, the IT admin has a much better ability to see who's using what data. So I'm currently logged into Comprise. I'm an IT admin. I can see all the functionality in Comprise. I'm on the Deep Analytics tab, which is the capability that Comprise provides that allows you to search at a very fine granular, granular level across all your storage. So in this case, suppose I'm the IT admin and I'm going to look for all the engineering data that's in the Atlanta site. So I can see all the data across all my sites. I know that the engineering data lives on these four file servers. So I filter the data down using date, uh, deep analytics. It's already being winnowed down to just those filers. In fact, then I can go further and say, let's make sure that the group ownership um, any files that I'm searching for belong to engineering. And I can further window it down and I can see engineering is using about 223 terabytes of data. In the traditional showback model, I'd probably just do a screen grab, do a PDF, send it to the engineering manager and say, look, you're using this much data, you're 23 terabytes over quota. Let's just say they've got a 200 terabyte quota. Can you help me reduce that? And you get into conversations about, well, you know, we need all our data. We can't slow down the organization. We need it to be able to generate all the builds and the products, et cetera. So the showback report is very unidimensional. It's a flat piece of paper or an email they get. What Comprise can now enable you to do is go a step further than just the report. What the IT admin can do is give that engineering manager access to Comprise Deep Analytics. And it's very simple to do. I showed this in the last webinar, but just at a quick high level, you can add that engineering line of business manager. As a user, the role is deep analytics and their access is limited to just the storage that they're allowed to see. It's what Scott uh, alluded to earlier. We call it share-based access control. So Comprise is providing both role-based access control that controls what you can see and do in the product and then further share-based access control, what shares they're allowed to see. And if I just quickly edit this user, you can see that the user has been uh, limited to just the storage that has the engineering data for this uh, line of business manager. So I have a second browser I'm gonna bring up. So the IT admin is in this browser. Here's the engineering line of business manager he or she now has ability to log into Comprise and they can do things they've never been able to do before. They log in, they only see deep analytics. This is their role. They can't change anything on your plan policies, your archiving, your tiering. They can't migrate data around. They can't add new shares. Uh, it's a very limited role in terms of functionality, but it's an extremely powerful role in terms of visibility of the data. So instead of just telling the engineering manager, by the way, I did this query and you had X amount of data. You can invite them in. Their shares are already limited to the data that, uh, that they own. 
And just to be sure, the engineering manager may uh, just select all of those. The engineering manager will then further say, well, this is not all my data. Those are the filers I'm on, but I'm sharing those filers. So again, she'll do the same ownership filtering and find out, yeah, I'm using data. Now, the numbers don't match up because I don't actually have a lot of storage to play with. These are all software emulations behind the product. So it's the real product running a software emulator. And every time you hit the query, it's going to generate a new number. So ignore the fact that this number doesn't match the 223 we saw earlier. But essentially, uh, in the real product, the engineering manager would log in, run the query, and see the same exact numbers. But in this case, we'll just play with these numbers. So the engineering manager comes in and says, yeah, 350 terabytes. I think that's all the data we have. That, that sounds about right, 4 million files. They can then start to dig in. It's no longer just a flat report of, here's the data. What do you want me to do with it? It's, oh, OK, I can do some things here. I can see the top shares where our data is located. Yeah, I recognize all these shares. That makes sense. Let me just see who owns this data. Just curious. Oh, yeah, these are the top engineers. This is my best lead engineer. He's done a lot of file, a lot of work. He owns a lot of the files. This makes sense. Let me see, just for grins, what kind of files we have. All right, wow. So now the engineering manager starts to think. Why are videos the top type of file type on the engineering shares? And uh, can further drill into just the videos. And now seeing, wow, we've got 50 plus terabytes of videos, 586,000 files. Let me look at those files and can generate a list very quickly of 10,000 or 1,000 of the files in the UI. Can download a report of 10,000 of those files and open the file and then examine in very much detail file names, file owners, file ages, where the files live, when they were last accessed, et cetera. Now, this again is all dummy data. But in this case, uh, based on the query, it would all be video files owned across engineering. And now the engineering manager would likely start to contact some of those owners saying, why do you have this large file uh, Here's the size in kilobytes, and it's a video file. Explain to me why you need this file, etc. And starting a dialogue with his team. And you'll notice so, what's Paul, happened to you. Yes. Sorry, but I had to chime in. The, the real life story, though, is we had a customer doing exactly this, and they found the uh, every episode of the Game of Thrones on someone's <laughs> directory. And there was the culprit, and it uh, turned into a pretty interesting conversation. And I say instead of a show back, that was more of a shame back uh, <laughs> conversation. Thanks for that anecdote, Scott. Yeah, earlier before that one, we also had another customer who found someone storing, they didn't tell us what type, but inappropriate storage of videos. And they had an HR intervention, notified the user of their policies of storage, et cetera. This, this happens. Uh, and unwittingly, this engineering manager has now become really the IT admin ally, right? Instead of the IT admin coming down and saying, you need to reduce your storage, the, the engineering manager has do dived in and found out there's stuff that shouldn't be there. What the engineering manager can then do is say, well, I found all these videos. They don't belong here. I'm going to save this query and give it a name, engineering videos. And therefore, any time in the future, the engineering, oops, looks like I've done this demo before, engineering two videos. Anytime the engineering manager wants to do a quick check, OK, we got rid of all those videos. How many do we have now? Can run this query again at any time. It's in the, the engineering manager's list of, video, of uh, uh, queries. And more so, the IT admin can also see that query. So now the IT admin can go and say, I'm going to find that. Uh, of course, it's not here. Interesting. Anyway. Uh, oh, because it was probably a private query. But in any case, the engineering manager can save the query. IT admin can use that query. And then that will lead to the second use case we have. But the first case is showback. It's actually active participation showback. Your division, department, organizational BU units, managers can now help you find the data that is inappropriate, that should be archived, that should be confined, or even Oh, I've got a project. Uh, it needs to be copied from here to maybe Dublin. There's a team in Dublin that needs to operate on it, or a team in uh, 
in Malaysia. And that data can then be found with a query and the IT admin can mobilize it. And that gets us into well, Before you go there, second. Paul, yes. yeah, just, just so I've, I've worked with a number of customers who, uh, who, who you know, are, are leveraging Shareback and they, they love it because it's a win-win scenario. So what you're doing is you're, you're, think about it, you're giving control to the end user so they have much more visibility and control over their own data which they want. They don't, they want someone else dictating what they have to do with the data. They can, they have more control and, and flexibility of what they do. And then also the storage, uh, the centralized storage teams, they don't want to be managing other people's data. They just want to set this up and forget about it. So they, they now can do that by handing the keys to the kingdom for their, well, the, the mini kingdom of, of, of the end users data stores and do their own thing. So it's just a win-win model that that's been very, very uh, well received by the customers I've been working with on using it. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Scott. It helps the IT team sort of delegate the responsibilities across the organization and makes these people storage allies, team allies, instead of uh, sort of an adversarial, I see this, what are you going to do about it kind of situation. So I believe most of the people on this call are centralized storage people, so it's going to make your jobs easier. Okay, and I just happened to notice there's a question that's come in. Uh, how does the product handle lots of duplicates of the same file that might be in the share and if dedupe on the storage device has reduced the real usage? So currently, uh, Comprise Deep Analytics and the Global File Index will index every file. Obviously, storage is doing a great job of dedupe and can save you a lot of the, uh, the storage space actually consumed by those files. We're actually working on an enhancement where we'll help you find potential duplicate files, give you reports on that, and then let you decide, A, are those actually duplicates? Sometimes uh, they are, sometimes they may not be, so let you do that check. And then if so, you can then do the same thing that I'm showing you here. Find those files, put them in a query, or the next step, tag that data, and then let IT manage that data, whether confine it uh, for later deletion, whether archive it just in case someone needs it, copy it somewhere if, uh, say, it's a researcher that made copies of data, now that researcher has left the company but actually wants a copy of all her data. Uh, you could copy that data somewhere for her to get. So that's a great question. That leads to the tagging operations. So the line of business manager created a query, and the IT manager can use that query to find the engineering manager's data. But the IT manager might say, actually, can you tag your data using one of our standard tags? And that way, multiple organizations, the engineering manager can use the same tag, marketing can use the same tags when they search their data, uh, QA can use the tags, product management, sales. The way that you work with tags, I showed in the last demo, but essentially, IT would have set up a number of tags with keys and values. They would have said, okay, please classify your data or even better, tell me what action you want to perform on this data. And there are certain values, you're allowed to archive it, copy it, confine it. In this case, the engineering managers might say, all this data is actually okay to archive. And they would tag the data with this tag. Here's a confirmation, are you sure you wanna apply this tag to all the files? Note that we're not, Comprise is not applying the tags on your files, in your file systems, on your storage. It's all within the comprised global file index that Deep Analytics uses. So your end users don't know anything about it. There's no work for them to do to manage tags, to apply tags. You don't have to ask them, please tag your files appropriately. The IT admin for that group is applying the tags within Comprise. Then the IT manager overall can say, you know, actually, I'm going to look for all data that's been tagged with that action tag, tag with the archive value. Now, across the organization, there may be multiple teams that have tagged their data and said, this is fine to archive with one query. I'll save this now as a ready to archive query. Anytime I run this query now, it's going to find files with that tag and let me then act upon it. So with user-driven tagging, it leverages the ability to have multiple people in the organization find their data, decide what to do with the data, tag the data appropriately for IT admins to then find it. 
And step three, this use case of data mobility. Obviously, the most important thing is acting on the data. You've now farmed out the ability for your organizational BU line of business managers to find the data. They've told you what they want you to do with it, archive it. The last step is to mobilize that data appropriately. In this case, uh, they wanted that data archived, so I would create a new plan. And let's just say this is the ready to archive plan. And I add a group for the plan. In this case, I just use that query at, uh, ready to archive. That's the query that I just created. And then I actually want to archive the data, and that's the move capability. So I turn on the move. The deep analytics query is pre chosen based on my previous selection. So now the policy of this archive is to use the query to find the files to then archive. And then I decide where I want them to go. For example, AWS, save the plan, and then I activate it. And so I've now mobilized that data based on what the users told me. And I've got some migrations going on from another demo, so there are some conflicts. So Comprise won't let you do things. There are guardrails to prevent you from accidentally doing things that would mess up your data. Uh, but essentially, IT can mobilize the data based on what the users have said. And it could be archive. It could also be copy or confine. There might have been a case where, uh, again, the researcher said, I need to copy the data for another group to work on. And in this case, let's make this the copy group. And I could use, again, a different query. Pretend that it was this. Uh, Tag action. I didn't create a tag for copy in the demo, but you imagine it could be any query. Again, uh, it's automatically using the query that I want. And I say, oh, this one actually has to go over to Google. That's where the researcher wants it. Save the plan. And now that data can be copied based on the user's desires. So those are three interrelated use cases. Showback, getting your organization to help you identify the data. Second, using the tagging to further allow the entire organization to give you clues on what to do with the data. And third, to actually mobilize the data. And there's a typo here, that should be three. So those are use cases you can use today to affect a lot of the day-to-day -day tasks that you need to do. Looking forward a bit to smart data workflows. This is essentially the same workflow I just showed you where you're searching within Deep Analytics, finding data, but now the action, instead of a comprise action of archiving, copying, or even confining, you can use your own custom action. It can be a third party, say it's provided by Amazon. It could be Macy, it could be another tool, it could be AI, it could be machine learning, it could be some function built in-house that you've got uh, running either edge in the edge devices or even on-prem. You find the right data to feed to those systems. You've now got a query that finds it. You use our APIs to then uh, have the third party operation, the action invoked upon that data. That third party analysis will further refine and enrich that data. It might be looking for PII. So you said, I want to find data from this owner across these particular shares. There it is. Actually, I'm very curious about which of those files have PII. I run it through Amazon Macy. Using our APIs, you then tag those files with an appropriate tag, PII, yes, or something, or category, PII. Then further, now that you've got those files tagged, you search for those tagged files. It calls the file set even further, just those PII-related files. And then you can extract, uh, in this case, you may want to, there might be legal holds for those files. There might be files you, can, uh, you need to remove, GDPR, for example. Uh, basically manage those files based on what data was found. 
And then further, you can manage the life cycle. So based on those files, they may need to be confined. And then you can use, as I just showed you, comprise deep analytics actions to confine it. You may need to copy it. The user said, I need to copy the data. Maybe it's just you can archive it. Uh, they found the data. They got a data list. You provided them a list. And now you can archive it. And then the circle repeats, because as new data comes in, uh, you can rerun this workflow. It can run automatically as well. And it'll just go around in a circle continuously, finding the files, further refining and enriching, culling, extracting, managing the life cycle. Mm -hmm. So we have some customers who are investigating this. They have some great use cases for applying this. Uh, one use case, again, as I mentioned, PII for data, legal hold for confining or for um, archiving. This ability to invoke your own custom third-party service makes this workflow extremely powerful. It's all built on Comprise, the Deep Analytics Global File Index, the ability to take action on what you find, and the ability to do this in a repeated fashion. So we think this is very powerful. We have a blog post that you're welcome to go uh, read on our website. And it's a particular example we're showing using Macy to find PII. And you can see it'll go through the, the whole steps uh, at a high level. OK, I don't see any of the questions right now. We're almost at the bottom of the half hour. So I'll turn it over back to Scott. Yep, thanks, Bob. Um, so uh, let's see, upper left-hand corner, we. You promoted these guides on the last call. We'll just promote them again. It's a couple new guides here, yeah. Um, I think most of you have already well deployed. So uh, just so you know that there is a comprised deployment guide out there. But the top one there, the the uh, quick start guide for analysis, uh, recommend going through it if you haven't already seen it. There's uh, It's a pretty comprehensive guide on doing comprised analysis. Uh, maybe a lot of things that have been lost and forgotten are not ever known in the first place. That'll be outlined in that, in that guide. So recommend checking that out. That's fairly new. Uh, we have another session coming up in two weeks. Uh, we're going to be talking about performance and best practices for performance. And uh, we don't have anything scheduled beyond that, so we would like to get your feedback. You know, let us know how this uh, session went. Uh, if you have topics of interest, please let us know. At the bottom of the screen there, you can see customer success at comprise.com. Just send us a note, and uh, you know, we'll, we'll schedule some more uh, webinars based on demand. I think that's the last slide, Paul. Do you have any more? Yep, that's the end of it. So maybe we'll hang out here for a minute or two if people have other questions. Uh, otherwise, that concludes this week's webinar. Thank you. Yeah, I don't see any questions coming in. Thank you very much. Okay. Talk to you all see next, you next time. time. Yep, bye-bye.